Greetings ladies and mental gents and welcome to my channel, where I like to make audio narrations of stories from across the internet. In this series, we'll be focusing on a web novel called There Is No Epic Lucha, Only Puns, from the website Royal Road. And in this video, we'll be doing chapters 93 to 94. I hope that you enjoy. There Is No Epic Lucha, Only Puns, Chapter 93 a King's Grudge Lord Mushy awaited Delta's answer. Pretend to be a dungeon? Delta repeated the question. She honestly should be proud that she was considered not a dungeon by Dio. She eyed the group. Kemi, the girl almost made Delta wish she had a pitfall just so that Kemi couldn't leave. It was looking not only in her cheery self, but also downright amazing in her cotton candy fluffy priestess robe. How on earth did someone sew clouds together? It was hugging but not revealing. It was light but not flimsy. It was cute but not demeaning. Delta wanted it by stripping the girl naked in her dungeon wouldn't send the best message. Besides, who else would wear it besides Luna? She imagined Rail proudly walking around down the river in the robe and snorted. Vass was also here. He was surrounded by Lordy's pots and looked amazed at the sheer skill jump in the mushroom had gained in such a short while. Delta wanted to rub her chin up in pride. That's right, Delta's kids were prodigies. She made a note to put a sewing needle in the hand of a gargoyle if she ever made one. If nothing else, they wouldn't be pricking their fingers if they messed up. And Dio. Oh, Dio. After seeing Isanella so much, the resemblance was uncanny. There was also something else. Something she only noticed now that her senses had been refined. The boy felt scarred. His manner swirled in a powerful but flawed ways, as if paths it should be able to travel were snatched away. Gone. Devoured. The lingering scars twinged with a foul, numbing feeling, and Delta narrowed her eyes. She moved closer and, carefully, sunk her hands onto his face. This felt invasive, but unlike her monsters, Delta couldn't touch people that much. It really seemed easier due to her demon powers, but Dio didn't even seem to notice. Her hands felt his manner, rich and warm like milk before bed, the sun on your skin, the love one's hug. It was beautiful, but as she felt up, near his brain and ears, the feeling was jaggedly torn away, and she yelped as she actually cut herself on the sheer tear. It was still sharp, cleanly torn inside Dio, but the manner had adapted, evolved to ignore the damage. The wound was old, very old. Dio would have had to have been a baby or... Or... She dropped her hands to her side. Delta was going to destroy the silence when she kicked down its doors. There was, is no reason to ever harm a child like this. Unless Dio's natural hearing was going to kill him, there was no reason. Dio hadn't hurt anyone. He had been damn nice to her. Her monsters and Delta let a growl escape. Dio was a friend. As a damned dungeon at heart, she was possessive of her treasures. Sure, I'll need a day or two, but I can make it happen, Delta said as the silence and stretched out on for a bit. Lordy cleared his throat and relayed the message, Dio cheered. Ask Dio if I can try something on him, she asked. Lordy made firm mouth motions despite having no mouth exactly. It was good enough, Dio only struggled a little to understand him. Oddly, the moustache helped. Sure, Dio Brando was always here to help, he promised with his beaming smile. Delta smiled and placed her hands near the jagged torn part. Maybe, since Dio had grown up with little mana, she could take its place. She gathered mana and swirled it around Dio. Kemi gasped as Dio began to pulse with an orange light. Wow, I feel warm, Dio said with a laugh. Delta focused, her vision splitting into lines of numbers. The walls were microscopic ones and twos. The air was mana mimicking the surrounding oxygen. Lordy was a physical shell pulsing with her manner. Dio, a glowing red sun, Vass, an oddly black pond that sucked up the light and came nearby. Kemi, a golden beacon of truth. She focused and Delta broke down, from human happy to Delta of processes, of a hundred simulations and ideas, each one suggested before being discarded as her manner gave life feedback of what did what, what failed. No success. She tried to be more like the core that she was, and her head pulsed, and she barely passed 200 simulations. 
a single manner doing this and that. Perhaps higher he there. Perhaps a little single particle of orange manner would be a bit faster. At this rate, it would take a year just to finish seeing what would happen if she carefully filled the air with up the manner. Delta breathed, and an emotion returned. Humanity. Her manner in this form and shape was too disorganized and unpurposed, too impure to do what she wanted. She wanted to kick something. She sighed, and Dio itched his ear and is suffering from air pressure. Thanks, Dio, she said, and the boy grinned. Later, Delta, Team Heroic Holy Pot will be back soon. I totally win. Pretend to win, he said and raced outside. Kemi opened her eyes, her hands unclasping. Had she been scrying, sensing, doing something like it, and she stared roughly at the direction of Delta's avatar was in. You are so nice. Praise to you, Delta. Kemi bowed and ran up the stairs. Oh, come back. I forgot to lock you in here and to make you stay forever. Delta whined. Damn it. What was the chances of an innocent girl like Kemi passing through in the next few years? Vass merely said something quiet to Lordy, and the tall creature laughed loudly. Many secrets await you. Please, do come back and seek them out. He encouraged the golem. Vass was slower to leave, but he looked thoughtful. Dalta grumbled about escaping maidens for a few more minutes, until she felt like the giant fire-breathing turtle, so she stopped and floated back to the pub, where Farah was pouring more water on Seth. Dalta was about to ask what the hell was going on, until she saw the water being literally sucked from the bucket and drained into the regrowing stump of Seth's hand. He's like a plant, just water him I guess. Vera shrugged. She went back to more clean water, and Seth looked less dead and more hungover as he grumbled. Delta was impressed, and a little scared. How would you kill this man near the river or an ocean? She felt he had more people come and decided today was going to be busy when she saw a red-faced quist shouting for the idiotic exploding teacup. Delta hoped that he meant Seth. She really did. There was a second person Delta had never seen before. A wispy woman, she looked as if a mummy had laid out for a tan and then been forgotten for a hundred years. Banal, I don't care about your hearing. My friend blew himself up again. He's damn water mage. How does he keep doing that? Quis yelled as the maestro opened up the tunnels for them. The woman gave maestro a once over. Cut back on the miracle grow of bean sprout. Size ain't the only thing that's falling off later. The raspy wrinkle warned. Maestro had no answer for that. The woman wasn't human, Delta just knew it, like an apple or a moldy old orange standing next to each other as Quiss and the woman appeared in the pub. Delta Bernal Goo, Bernal Dungeon and Monsters. Now see if he needs help, Quiss sighed. He looked around. Thank God, a bar. He praised the skies. I'm an innkeeper, not a doctor. The woman hissed, but she bent down nonetheless. She began to touch the tender points and Delta noticed how her golden eyes saw more than she let on. Minor manner conversion. Typical manner horse waste. Bah! Man is a fool. He's of water, not ice. He should just keep to his element. The woman held out a hand to Ferrer. Something strong for me, I'll pay, she said. Ferrer actually choked back a gasp. Pay? You'll pay? Ferrer rushed over and began to mix bottles. Honest customers. Delta guessed Farrah might want some of them. Depends on the drink, Gu warned. Seth uses ice because water causes leaks in cities when he uses it. Quis grumbled. Despite his annoyed attitude, he was watching Seth's form with real worry. He sipped his drink and it looked different from the shroom pop. Quis smirked as he watched Farrah. Strong, but I've burned my tongue on hotter things, he bragged. Farrah waited and then Quis burped. Shake him for a moment and then his eyes actually watered. It's called troll tears for a reason. I use a few spins of a new assistant's wooden spoon to mix in the spirit. She grinned. Delta gasped. That spoon was used for troll soup. Goo pressed a point near Seth's elbow and the man gasped awake. Goo said something quietly. Seth's eyes slid close and the woman for a moment looked much younger. Her wispy hair and little black before, she grunted and sat back into decrepit. He's fine. Pure dungeon water is the next best thing, short of a pure nature spring or some unicorn urine. Goo snorted and cackled. Vera passed her an oddly green drink, which doctors medicine Vera often. Delta watched at the bubbling glass. What's in there, Vera? she asked quietly. 
Vera covered her mouth to mask her words. Some pygmy dark paralytic crushed in, mixed with one part guntrot and mended with the rare herbal flowers from the secret garden. A touch of royal honey mixed all together. Oh, and rum. Divina promised me her nature spirits weren't in the flowers yet, but I can't be sure, so she may be drinking the actual spirits. Vera listed. Data stared in horror at her goblin, and the worst part was, Goo ordered a second one not long after that. King Lendius sat on his throne, and a select council of royal guards watched him slowly grip the report. He tried to keep his cool. A king that lost control was sad sight indeed, but Amir mentioned the sheer audacity of the words before them made him want to throw his crown out of the window and scream. He felt anger, bubbled, and he smelled cheese. Lendius's eyes snapped about, but there would be none. The very room itself had been cursed with a stench. He had priests and powerful mages work spells, but the best that they could do was mask it for some time. It was still too easy to smell. My king, that shanty cursed place, is no concern, a woman offered. Generia, mistress of coin. Her eyes cut better than any sword. No concern, no concern! Have you read the report? It mentions by name several interesting parties, one of which will be Holy Care. Wonderful crimes in 55 different accounts of the city alone, one of which is an assault of this own king. Landius leaned forward and threw the report to the ground. Another is Mila Darknessbane. Maybe you remember her as the monster that dropped our royal drake's left leg on my front doorstep and told me I would be able to bargain for the rest attached. Need I even mention this name, Isinella Brando? He screamed. Cole lost, mood ruined. A few people gasped loudly at Brando's name. Damn, that woman and her monster husband. The brazen new royal knight stepped up. Menda, or some such. He was too new for the king to know him too closely. His royal knights grew every year for this very reason, to make up for the losses sure to come. Let me go and bring them to justice, he knelt and requested. There was a silence. Then a figure was just there, an arm yanking the boy to his feet. The knight turned to chew out whomever it was, but his words died off as the cloaked Lorsa stared back. Back in line, Egg, Lorsa said calmly. Mendo obeyed meekly. Lendius felt better, seeing the oldest royal knight, the one who guarded him as a child. Lorsa, so glad that you can join the hubbub. Poor Hal giggled and waved. The slightly rotund woman made people look away in fear. The king allowed her to speak openly. The woman had done much in his service, many dark things. Her new apprentice stared at Lorsa with interest. Odd boy, that one. Oh. The new star under Perhal was quickly climbing the ranks, willing to do any and all tasks given to him. His strength grew with it astronomically. Some said that he was a gift from the gods, others said that he was a curse waiting to happen. Lendius didn't much care. The boy had been found in some odd sleepy town that suffered a stray bandit attack. The town was oddly unknown to the king, and yet the boy didn't look like he was a victim. He looked like a warrior. Lendius leaned back, and he knew that the boy only spoke in carefully prepared lines and stared silently, as if his name of Alfar was very one ended up calling him Al. Even the king was somewhat unable to really explain why they took such interest in the boy. Attacks on the town would be unwise even if needed. Durance is and always has been a promise. They would go to that town and they would stay there. And they have done so. Lorsa calmly picked up the report, scooping up the paper slowly. Landius squirmed with a touch of guilt at the shame that is temper. But Lori, they're getting mana now. That means that they won't be still for long. Best to crush them and drink them dry before they become a pest. Perhol sang. Another knight spoke up. Control your disgusting habits, Perhol. Durance was grey, but the dungeon appeared. Are we to blame for that? They could no sooner do that than control the sun. It's unfair even for one to criminals who agree to a prison their own terms. Provoking them would be stupid. Adala warned. A clever woman whose arrows could hunt people like beasts. The king admired her for her robust common sense. Yet leaving them alone without a warden was always a risk. Before, it was a danger to our men, but now with manner, it would not be unreasonable. A knight nodded. Lendius frowned. That deal, 
how much of that deal was an ultimatum. Mila, Darkness Bane, had cut through his already injured men and told him flatly, Leave us alone to grieve and die, and we'll leave your city alone to stand. She whispered, and then she was gone. That was the deal. The king had lies spread, contracts, promises, blackmail. All lies. But Lorsa had made it sound good, and the kingdom soon believed the king had exiled these criminals in a stalemate. He hadn't been stupid. He had the place watched. People arrived and yet no one left. He followed trails and found no recruiter. People just woke up one day and went to Durance. Not any old beggars, but dangerous people. All mail from Durance, slow as it was, was checked, read and sealed. There was no magic, no hidden code, but people stepped coming. It was maddening. Lorsa has been in charge of tracking the progress of the migration, but there are many duties left as secondary. In Lorsa's words, let them gather into a spot, the grey would end them all. He trusted Lorsa to do what was needed. Lendius closed his eyes. This Noland, he used to return with a scribe who will act as his apprentice. With him, I want two knights as an escort. I want complete reports, I want to know strengths, I want to know numbers, and I want to know viable plans for an invasion is needed. Is that clear? He said to Lorsa and his own scribe who was writing down every word. Who shall go? Lorsa asked, as if he hadn't just stated that he was sending two of the most deadly warriors on a tax run. Zane and Pohol, he said, and the woman, busy snacking on something burned to a crisp, blinked. Me? Oh, I'll bring Al for some hands-on training. She beamed. Lorsa tilted at her head. A sign of extreme agitation for Lorsa. He knew that well. Usually we pair different mindsets to make sure that all thoughts and venues are covered. Lorsa said logically. Lendius leaned his head into his hand. Sometimes a battle axe with two blades will stir things faster than a sword and a shield. He stated, Lorsa bowed. I shall inform Zane of his duty. But how? I doubt we'll need to chase you down tomorrow. Lorsa was gone before the woman could answer. Oh, pooh! I hate when the leader does a vanishing trick. Can't even invite them for tea. She told at the blank-faced owl. Lendius dismissed the unneeded, and the four knights remained in the corners of the throne room. Three of them were absolute masters in their area. The fourth was just blessed with an ability that made him too perfect for Lendius to ignore. Knight, he said quietly. The man clenched one fist, and from his feet a ripple of white energy scoured the floor, removing chases of germs, dirt, and from boots, and the smell of cheese. Minutes of blissful, clean air. This was a blessing. He nodded his thanks to the man as the room was cleaned of mana. He wasn't strong enough to remove the curse of Haldi, but his natural gift to break mana down and to repel it was good enough to earn him a spot in Lendius' royal knights. In a way, all of his knights served one purpose very well. It wasn't like the old days of his forefathers, where any criminal scum was branded with the loyalty mark. Now, he could read lists of applicants, judge people on their own power and actions. Decide it was better to let these beasts, most of them anyway, stand behind him with weapons or loose them on the streets with innocent people. Zane was such a person. The world was darker if he was free, but somehow just as bad as with him being a knight, growing stronger with access to the dungeon. The deal. A proper deal. Loyalty with a promise of blood. Besides, Zane had a history with a man endurance, if you remembered right. Why not throw a bone to the knight watching over his youngest daughter? Pahal. Honestly, Lendius just wanted her gone for a short while. At least endurance, it might be left untouched after she left. Maybe. He sat there and waited. Waited for the fear in his heart to release control over his feet. Even to this day, Haldi had left more than a bad smell in his home. Lorsa walked out of the wall. Well, not the wall, just the hearth and space afterwards that made it look like they did. That's bloody annoying, the woman haunched over her desk and said as a skinned red rabbit. First words you say to me in almost thirty years, and that was it. Lorsa complained. Mila snorted. I've got a few more if you want them. You're the first decent target I've had since my kids finished school. The woman buried her knife into the table and stood. Oh, Rooney went back. Ah, how is the little demon princess? 
will also help to sell to a hidden bottle of cheap wine hidden in the roof rafters, exactly where it had been left all those years ago. She is annoyingly rude, annoyed at the world and makes friends with monsters and dungeons. I can't believe she grew up so wild, Mila complained. Oh gee, I can't believe it either. Her also drank from the bottle, her hood dropping to reveal her silvery hair. Where did you get that one? Mila grunted, Lorsa smiled. Yell built it. I had to fetch him bloody rare books and statues and art. The snob has gone artsy. Lorsa said before lowering her bottle. I always wanted to ask, I'll visit, but with the grey, I couldn't afford to shut down. The letters, the tricking, the bribes. I hoped you knew that I was still helping where I could. She added, Mila nodded. With each creep that showed up, you had your smug little fingerprints all over it, she agreed. How's your princess? I heard she's finally breaking out of her shell, Mina asked politely. Surma. Good girl, but if she's more like her mother than she knows. Her father. Also winced, but Mila waved it off. Is an idiot who let things get bad as they did. I've had a lot of time to be annoyed about it, but I'm old and I care less than I do about the fact that you're drinking my wine. She held out her hand. Amused, Lorsa passed it over. How is high? Mila said, and Lorsa blinked. Oh, you were out for a few years. You might want to brace yourself for all of this. Hi ran off. Lorsa said bluntly. Mila gulped, wise wide. No freaking way. She wouldn't leave her brats. Mila denied Lorsa's words instantly. Well, with Lendius as a husband, I could see her giving up, but she didn't leave. I said, ran off. Lorsa raggled her finger. Queen Hera, long way from a little mousy pickpocket high. So where did she go? Church? Thieves guild? In her fancy gown? Mila snorted at the image. Lorsa's tone was flat as she spoke. Currently, she's a contract on the floor of 100 of Yell's dungeon. The wine bottle cracked and shattered. Delta stared at the garden that used to hold a weird gazebo. The fountain was gone. It was replaced by something quite odd. The statue of New was on the round stone platform. On his stone screen were a few lines, but it had been covered by moss, and the fact that it was a little cracked was making it hard to read. The two floating hands were splayed open and taunting people to read. The well of wisdom is deep, but you're all up a creek without a bucket. Delta read aloud, but let her mind space out a little to take the room in. She blinked and stared at the bubbling well hidden under the hollow statue. The glowing orange liquid was still like glass. Delta let the numbers appear, and her garden became a still digesting room and information covered her manner to her eyes. The well was barely a few drinking glasses full, but someone would have to climb down to reach it. She brought up the menu and watched as the menu drew together, information flowing from her core and imprinting it on her manner, shaping it and making it real. So that was how the menu looked in progress. Neat. She came back to the human sight, and her eyes almost went backwards as she blinked hard at the words, Well, of potential. By taking the silence's essence during the attack and also an abyss fountain, you have converted it into a similar well, but you're with your own touch. The well of potential lets someone take a concentrated drink of your manner. The effect is different for everyone. If a person is not strong enough or talented in any area, they will simply be empowered for a short while. Only one person can drink from the well a day. After that, the reminder of the well will return to orange juice. Cannot be upgraded, cannot be built, cannot be moved. Find more silenced things to take them, just like old times. Delta pursed her lips. If I find out that the stealing eyeball thing is real, I'm going to make you wash your hands before we talk again. She warned, but the menu simply vanished. Delta let out a sigh as she stretched, looking up. She froze. We've been noticed. Perhaps she doesn't see us. We could be on that well hidden. No, she's seen us, and she's rising, keening noises is an indication. Quite. This is our first impression. A nearby hill moved and Nashi woke up. She yawned and looked around. Where's the chicken? What's the screaming? She demanded. She looked over and paused. Oh, well. News in the doghouse, she mumbled. Delta stared up at four looming figures and a vision flickered under her shock, causing their forms to flash as if orange lightning was in the background. Four faces, only one of them close to human. 
One peered down, and the most hideous bat like snout Delta had ever seen. The next one she thought was a bird until she saw its dark, wide eye sockets. A doctor, a plague doctor's stone face. This last monster visages of something like a dragon but deformed. The leader, as the rest of them looked up, crossed his arms. His hair was wavy and dark. His chest defied. His deep eyes and, uh, brooding. We're thinking of the stoned four. The bat one sounded pleased. The rest of you were noises of disgust. Delta closed her eyes, opened them, breathed, then spoke. I am so getting sued, she declared. End of chapter. There is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 93.5 Interlude Dungeon Education The money from the bank was used to get Mass a better sword, and even some armor, and was money well spent in Summer's opinion. There was always the issues of buying equipment from the growing boy, but he seemed skilled with a sword enough that his size barely slowed down his strikes. Thank you kindly, princess, but the lady is too kind to spend money on this damn boy. Zan, the dwarf priestess, said quietly. Soma shrugged. I'd rather be down a few coins than dead if Mass's sword breaks at a bad time. He explained and Mass showed off his armor. Zane grumbled as he showed Mass the best way to wear his sword. Zane really wasn't that bad when he didn't mind someone or found them harmless. The man had bought Soma an ice cream cone once because her mother had... Soma cleared her throat. Very few royal knights were completely evil. Her hull came close. Jesha was another, and her brother was a good contender when he pushed his way onto the roster. Jerima had really not taken Mother's departure well. So Denneman the Rattus read a book while sitting on the shop's comfy-looking window seats. The sunlight shining through his white fur made him look divine for a moment before he neatly defaced the book with a sigh muttering in his low tone about mistakes and the out-of-date information. His equipment was updated and even a little better maintained than that of the average adventurer. Between himself, Zahn, and Mass, the group had the equal proper Bronze three rank in terms of experience and power. Nearing the time of the Surma's first adventure, she felt a tickle of nervousness rise up. She truly understood that these strangers would guard her life, and that she would guard theirs in return. Why are you frowning? Mass appeared in her vision, and Surma held a yelp beneath her royal cough. I'm merely preparing myself for the first dungeon dive ahead. She promised Mass blinked. Prepare. You're just going to fight some monsters in a cave. Just some slashing and courage is all you need, right? He said confused, and Surma's stomach dropped. Mass... Do you know what a dungeon is, correct? She asked slowly, and the weapon shop went quiet as Brolda nearly snapped her spear in half with her fingers alone in shock horror. Zan spoke up hesitantly. Dear, Mass was raised by blood apes. He was lost in the woods, and I found him. Many things that he doesn't understand. Zan tried to defuse the awkward silence. Oh... Soma looked at Mass's unshamed face and thought on how best to phrase this. You're all frecked, Zane said as he tried on an ogre helm for fun. Soma led the group to the black grand marble gate. Two statues of nice crossing weapons formed an arch. The entrance to the royal dungeon. Soma remembered when she was seven and her father had brought her here. The room was cold and black stones scared Soma as noises. Inhuman noises flowed out from the opening gate. She had cried and the dungeon had gone quiet. That had scared her more than anything, so she ran away, ran to her mother. There wasn't an option anymore. She turned to the royal knights, who hesitated. While Zane glared at the gate, and Brolder tried not to stand over and protect Surma. Mass needs some practice. Just a few falls and we'll come back, he said quietly. Surma knew blackboards and textbooks would be useful as zombie leeches for someone like Mass. Mass would learn best by seeing. A touch of danger and a hint of a challenge. Soma had often wished her own teachers would have done the same for her. I'm glad to see that the princess is stepping up. A deep voice called out. Soma spun around in a golden figure floating in the air. His body forming like a rising sun. Legs first, then torso and arms finally eyes. Every inch was a glorious golden aura like the night pierced the dawn. Yell. The royal dungeon's personification had deepened appear before them. 
Soma tried to do the polite bow, but Mass was pointing his new silver sword at Yell. Soma is important. You don't talk to her without being polite, he growled. Yell smirked, and he tilted his head at Mass. How rude of me. Tell me, young warrior, will you be escorting the dear flower into my depths? He asked. Mass puffed up his chest. Your dungeon. You can look cool, but that doesn't make you the lord of this here cave. Summer's going to kick rear and show how Team Ultra Dragon Explorers have never backs down. Mass said proudly. Zahn was making odd choking noises as Summer's knights were silent in awe of Mass's bravado. Yell looked down towards Mass. Your expression, the courage of youth, I think I shall carve it in with my hole. Yell mused and then met Summer's eyes. Hurry to the tenth floor, there is a treasure unique to you waiting. He commanded and then began to break up. I am glad to see that you are finally smiling. Hi will be. The avatar faded and Soma felt her heart ache at the same time. Mother? She whispered when Mass turned to grin. Sum, let's show that snob ghost how we rock, he offered. Then sighed as Sir Denerman spoke up. On average we have a greater chance of reaching the tenth floor than not. But tally ho, we shall surely win. The rat man squealed as Brilda glared at him, her spiky manner flowing over him. Brilda came close and put his hand on Summer's cheek. Her blonde hair and ice clear irises were soft, the softest Summer had ever seen. I shall wait until you come back. I shall wait. Please come back, my little tadpole. If the dungeon takes you, I will end it. She said so quietly that only years of being with Brolder let Soma hear her. The princess smiled and clasped a hand over her cheek with affection. I shall make sure not to let you down. Knowing that you are waiting means that I have more than enough reason to come back, my protector. Soma beamed. Brolder gave the rarest of smiles and placed a chaste kiss on Soma's forehead. May the old mother spear guide you, and may your heart be your light. I believe in you. Brolder promised, and that... That was more encouraging than that Soma had ever gotten out of her father in years. A fire ignited in her heart, and she nodded stoutly. Brolder, prepare supper. I'll be back shortly. She commanded and turned to walk towards the open gate. I'm betting on you, kid. Other nights, not so much, but you got good people, Zane called. Mess waved at him as the dwarf priestess son and the ratus Sir Denoman, Sir Deno, followed. Mess, of course, took the lead. Denno. No one but himself and his mother called him Denno. Followed the group. He was a high-ranking mage, and he viewed his current group with a mix of opinion. On the one hand, the priestess and the princess were both high quality and showed a proper attitude to Dungeon Darby. On the other hand, Mass. The boy was bright, cheerful, oblivious. If it wasn't for his excellent sword skills, Dina would have protested. Well, that and the princess philosophy glare that is his suggestion to boot the child from the group. Such a young human should be playing and enjoying life, not diving into dangerous battles. But Dino was outvoted and now he had nothing on his mind but taking care of the boy. Mess was being covered by the sly protection seal at all times, and his sword was enchanted with sharpness. Dino did not like to put children in danger. Rattlings or humans, Dino liked children. He was almost a schoolteacher until the Rattling Civil War broke out. His math skills attracted attention and the higher-ups forced him into advancing magic formula for fireballs. His potential school had been raised in his absence. Dino had left the underground shortly afterwards to seek brighter ventures. Children made him nervous. Too fragile, too young. Mass was skilled though, and Dino tried to make sure that he respected that as they entered the dungeon entrance area. The entrance room to the royal dungeon was like a floating platform above a yawning abyss. Dungeons never upgraded their upper floors, but these types of rooms were the lone exceptions. The darkness below was filled with the skittering forms and traps. Once something was thrown in, nothing was coming back out. Oddly, Dino saw a side path being constructed leading to a room blocked by a sign reading Under Construction. The sign above the door simply read Memorial. The dungeon with a memorial. Signs kind of off to me. Zion said briskly. Princess Soma eyed it, but said nothing as she headed towards the lone corridor to lead on. Let me take the lead. I'm used to ambushes. Mass promised. Dina looked at the room. He had seen many dungeons. 
More than a few ended up forming underground as stars crashed down into the middle layer of the world. They formed with the various races that lived there. This was new. Dungeons did not care for the living, nor their memory. This, this scared Dino, like ants being noticed by a god, to be ignored and allowed to be treated the dungeon like a cave or a horrid pit let people ignore the omnipresent being that they carved up and used their body for raw materials or training. The knowledge of the entirely alien being behind every door or every shadow was too harsh for the average person. To treat the dungeon as a place, not a person, was easier. There was comfort in that. To not understand dungeons, but how could one feel when a dungeon understood you? Dino looked down into the abyss and saw not monsters, but parts of a being that was watching. He hurried to catch up with the rest. He didn't want to be alone in the place that those great eyes turned to him. The main corridor was a basic soil and rock. Soma stopped her group. I have studied the dungeon with care over the years. I know the many trap placements and monster types. Princess Summer said that brought hope until the yawn sounded out. No avatar appeared, but the dungeon's voice spoke out. Tch, I changed some things. Just a few small things. I loathe to mess with my history, but you are worth it. Yao promised Dino bowed low, magic ready to fly, to protect. No more fire. No more blood, his magic sought to preserve life, not end it. Dino respected the Princess Soma for not reacting to the voice, more than he cared to admit. Mass stood straight. Bring it, you spook, me and Soma got this thing in the bag. He grinned, but Soma held up one hand. I fear no changes. My group and I are strong and able to take your madness. Soma promised. Yal didn't respond, but a low growl sounded ahead in the darkness. No torches here. Dungeons did not like providing light to people. Dino focused the light glowed from his perfectly straight, ruler-like staff. Zan began to glow a deep green color of her god. It was enough light to see the prowling of giant rats. Dino scowled as his distant ancestors were being reduced to walking on all fours. But he held back his grunt as Mass took up a guard of the princess. We got food stealers, Mass called. Dino answered with a hefty fireball that killed one and disabled another. The group was quickly covered in a stone skin, an earth spell of armor. Dino and Surma were gasping, but Mass was clearly used to it. Zan finished her prayer. Stone skin, go. Bash their heads in, you sons of a bucket, she hollered. Dino was a fire in person. He wasn't a good with the world tree scorcher, or even the dragon, but... His fire had purpose, and he used it to remove rat foes with ease. Mass was quick to cut off feet and heads off as the princess fired bolts of magic to blow up the remaining ones. Zahn stepped forward and grunted as a blunt arrow smashed into her stomach from hidden holes in the wall. The stone arrowhead easily broke on her defensive enchantment. The rats died and various arrows tried to skewer the party as they moved from the first room. Dino grunted as he rolled, avoiding the lost volley of arrows. Tough opening act, Zahn panted. Yell's trial of arrows has always weeded the weak from those who with potential. Soma said as they eyed the first proper room of the royal dungeon. It was a messy mop of trap holes and spy traps where wooden poles would shoot up and impale the blind and the idiotic. Dino waved his hand and a quick air spell that barely brushed the surface of the soil revealed most, if not all, of the traps to the human eye. The dungeon must have really fed on idiots to have grown off of these traps. No trap was equidistant nor the same size. It was hideous. The princess quickly found the path to the end of the room by avoiding the holes and spikes. It ended up being the path that resembled a snake in many ways. Annoying, but easy to see with some patience. Soon they all rested at the junction. The left leads to the dead end with a huge pitfall. The princess said quietly and turned right. The corridor was right quiet except for the odd blood stain. Legend has it that the first floor consumed so many that they left their mark. The princess explained. Mass was quiet, finally feeling the difference in the air. His young face frowning at every shadow and potential mound. Good. Dungeons were not holidays, nor were they kind. The next room was huge, and the cabin was a thin path to travel. Shields up, Somebody warned. 
and her impressive garments turned solid as they edged on. More arrows shot out from the walls, leaving Soma to only guard from the one side. Dina was impressed with her stout confidence. He looked at the priestess and her stone spell was renewed, and they tried to cover the space of arrows that broke on their skin. The princess gasped as an arrow fired from the statue from the front of the path. She tried to rise her arms in defense, but it was Mass who slashed the arrow in half with a blank expression before it could hit the princess. Impressive, even if it was from the side and not down the middle like some childish idea. Th th that wasn't that wasn't in the history, the princess gasped. Sir, you know nothing. This dungeon learned, Mass said grimly. Soma shook her head. No, this has been... The path has been the same for hundreds of years, and Ara here means that I know nothing. Soma began to gasp heavily. Dino moved forward. It was Zan who heaved her up. Then you have a duty to your people to report these changes. Up and at it, you poor pebble, the dwarf urged. The dungeon never changes. The only massive thing that it did was take my mother. Soma said hoarsely. Dino grimaced. He knew all about the queen who fled into the dungeon. Poor victim or treasure-seeking wretch. He would soon find out. Mass glared at the statue of the dungeon avatar as the group was again faced with the choice of left or right to take. Left, I think, Soma said with uncertainty. The girl had been shaken. Dino took her exposed hand in his paw. Soma met his eyes with an obvious fear. The dance of the dungeon making so many changes that your knowledge becomes entirely obsolete is less than 2%. Your history, your lessons are gold. Do not fret, we are relying on you. Dino said with confidence. It was both a true and a lie. Dungeons defied reason, and Dino had no idea what it had changed to take the princess out of the element. He wouldn't rely on the girl to provide accurate information, but he also knew that changes took time. The princess nodded solemnly. Brilda is waiting for me, she answered, as if it was a charm to ward off unknown dangers. Yes, she is. Now lead like a royal blood you possess, Dino urged. The girl stood and rocketed off to stop Mass from opening the door with a little care. Trust nothing, the doors can be trapped, she reminded him with an atypical calm tone and rich and noble. Dino nodded, sharing a look with Zahn as Mess cut the wooden swinging axe that Soma accurately predicted in the corridor beyond. Her knowledge was accurate at this level at least. However, Dina was ready to fight that one unknown variable. Just one could cause chaos. Like the Ansemarin problem of numbers and reality. One wrong number made the solution into a paradox. Like those sheep loving priests who worship the two left eyed gods. Dino was mapping as he went, and he sent a prayer to the goat that he left and right. Order and numbers, his only defense against the chaos of life. Brolda had Zane pinned to the wall of the cave with his spear glowing dangerously red at his throat. Take it back, she hissed. Zane looked unimpressed as he sighed. Listen, the girl's as good as dead. The boss is going to chew her alive on the tenth floor. I'm just being honest. He easily freed himself from Brolda's grip. The light red turned black and Zane's neck gained a long, thin, breeding line. He blinked. No one's made me bleeding. Well, freck me. You actually like the young priestess, he joked as he wiped the dripping red line. Princess Surma will win and you will guard her with your own life. Rolda said with no room to argue, but Zane grunted with his neck healed on the spot. I don't need a contract runt telling me what to do he said bluntly as he grabbed her spear head with his hand burned at the contact. You want to save her? Should have stayed inside the dungeon and been a good little boss. Zane grinned. That made Brolda glare with shock. Who? she demanded. There was a hand on her shoulder. Brolda also was calm as ever. Of course. Brolda let Zane walk off and she glared at the cloak figure who was eerily calm. Brolda turned her fury to the woman. You let loose my past, Brolda said quietly. Things slip. Being the third oldest makes people talk. Your name was well feared back in the day. Brolda of the spear, how many warriors you pierced and removed before you emerged to suddenly take care of the princess? Odd, but fortunate, Rosa said calmly. There was no fortune about it. Brolda emerged to care for the princess Summer for one reason only. The woman who could command the dungeon could easily make Brolda feel human again. 
she gave the woman purpose, and the purpose was, Is this about that loose queen? Zane said bored. Rolda blinked and Zane was broken. His arms and torso were jutting out at odd angles. His breathing hitched and his eyes glazed over as Lorsa stood over him. At a death, given to the man in less than a second. Less time than Brolder could react to. Lorsa stared down and spoke quietly. Oh, so ever quietly. Do not speak of the queen without respect. I warn you once. Lorsa said, the calm of a gay to hide a boiling fury. Y- y- yes, come on, Dada. Lorsa, Zane said in a rasp as his youngs tried to inflate themselves. Rolda tried to breathe, but her throat didn't work. The manner choking her was old, ancient, tired. She tried to make a noise, but she couldn't even tremble. Lorsa turned her head, tilted until she made a small noise. Oh, I'm really sorry. Rolda, forgive me. Lorsa asked with actual shame as the air became free of Lorsa's power. Zane glared and Lorsa eyed the ceiling. Wait for her. I have no doubt Princess Surma will be back soon. Zane, we have a task tomorrow. Please make sure you check your mail. Lorsa said distractedly. You smell of wine. Zane said as his neck snapped back into position. Lorsa paused. She sounded amused suddenly. I saw an old friend today. Wine was the calmest part of it she admitted, and then vanished between the seconds. Lorsa's gift. How Brother feared them. How could one run when distance and time meant nothing to your hunter? Brother just decided not to anger the leader and fear of those outcomes. It was easier on her mind. On the hundredth floor of the dungeon, a woman looked up at Lorsa and walked out of the halls. Lorsi! The woman beamed at her as she emerged from her bed. The hidden room was protected by three mini bosses and one puzzle involving a king of ancient past. The woman hugged her as Jal appeared. You're using too much mana. I can only fill that shell with so much, he said grouchily, distractedly as he chiseled a hunk of rock. Lorsa ignored Yal. Respect owed to the ancient being was easy to ignore when she herself was older. Lorsa smirked. She was also a better dungeon core if things came down to childish arguments. Not that she had a dungeon any more. Those fair play fools had seen to that. Hi, how are you? She asked, and Yell filled her physical shell with mana. With no more home on her own, she couldn't produce mana any more. Being kindly neighbors, she had come to Yell for help, only to find the city growing around him. That had been enough to make Lorsa curious. The rest was history. She guided his human people, and he in turn fed her mana. How many kings and queens had she guided? Too many. But High was special. High had seen Lorsa for the creature she was. I'm good. How's my babies? How are my children? High demanded. Lorsa tried not to flinch. Such honest earnesty. Surma turned 16. She said slowly. Yell closed his eyes. High looked like she had been struck. 16? No, no. She, she, she was just 8. She was only 8 of a short while ago. Tell me, time hasn't passed that much. I begged and grabbed Lorsa's cloak. Lorsa let her. Lorsa would always let her. Always. She is wonderful, so beautiful and brave. Lorsa pulled out the sketches that she had made of the girl. I gasped at them like a drowning man at air. My child, my baby. I gasped and fell to her knees, hugged them to her chest, crumpling them. Lorsa tried not to flee. Not to run from the consequences of Yal, hers, and the sister's actions. The words floated back to Lorsa. A human model. Brother wants more details on people. We need to know about people and dungeons when they don't kill each other. Sister, so cheery, so monstrous. Not so much now. Sis has learned consequences. Delta has made her see. Yal promised. Lorsa looked up at the figure who had the carving tools idle in his hand. Was this Delta worth it? She asked bluntly and high sobbed. Yes, she has changed much, and if you are still connected, I would not have to speak. Delta has brought ambition, joy, potential. Humans make more sense. No, that is wrong, Yal mused, and he turned with a smile. Delta has been a path we all follow. Things make sense. People have reasons, ideas. Now I see this. They aren't just food to feed my goals, but creatures of passion. 
Yeung held his hands up and then he eyed Hai, who looked surprised to see the man talking so much. Hai had supplied the system information on the detailed, complicated human, forced the sister to allow that data and the dungeon system to accommodate such a being. Yell mused. He bent down and patted Hai kindly. Delta is our daughter in the realm of ideas. She's so wonderful. He beamed, her face blank. Lorsa raised one foot. The dungeon shook as she whacked the core with a mighty kick. Creep. Hi. Ignore him. I'll see this Delta soon. I'll make sure that she won't be an issue. Lorsa promised. Hi held pictures of Soma close. Can, can I go home soon? She asked hopefully. Lorsa's voice failed her. A box appeared and they all eyed it with slight fear. Soon. Very soon. Delta is your key and you will be needed outside. The box faded as sister's words were gone, but Lorsa had never seen such an orange box. I blinked, but Lorsa tried to grab the box. Look at me, she demanded. Her current physical form was no issue, but the core that acted as her heart was. Sister didn't even hesitate as it vanished. Lorsa almost screamed in frustration, but controlled herself. You're disconnected. Sister Bro won't even look at you, Yell sighed. I've done nothing but help them, Lorsa said quietly. Yell frowned and then spoke up. Can't look at you then. You know Verse is disconnected and he won't take it lying down. They might just be careful, Yell offered, that name sent many emotions flying around Lorsa's mind. Verse. Sol. Silver. That was one cracked chicken egg if Lorsa had ever seen one. A dungeon core that escaped the rules and expected to be praised for it. It was lucky that it hadn't been hunted down and removed. Brother was not the kind, forgiving type. He vanished, no one, no dungeon has felt a hint of it in ages, Lorsa pointed out. Spooks and angry teens don't fade away. Silver is biding his time. Bet on it. Yell said firmly, Lorsa of the ghost dungeon sighed. True, she admitted. Yell suddenly grinned. Hi, your kid is about to enter the first boss room, he announced in a sing-song voice. I rushed over to a mirror, which she smashed with her fist into. The surface rippled like water, and the faraway scene appeared. The scene showed a group of two eager teens, a stoic dwarf, and a nervous ratus versus the Yale's first boss. Hey, giant bug. I hate that thing. It's like the most generic first boss creature ever. Lawson muttered. Princess Surma raised her hand and magic demolished one of the centipede spider creature's nine eyes. Yes! Go, sir, me! Make mama proud! I hooted. Yell blinked. You had tea with Hector last week, he accused, glaring at Hai and pointed at the confused bug as it tried to eat the stone-covered dwarf. Hai eyed him with a grin. Daughters before monsters, she winked. Also leaned back and enjoyed the show. Despite the monsters she sent to Durance and the ones she recruited into knights, there was something fun about seeing novices panic as the bug grew a second head. End of chapter. There is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 94. God Goyles. Four gargoyles made Delta's monster limit weep. She had one more left, due to the fact that absorbing the silence land meant to give her more resources than normal earth. Odd, but if Sis had a grudge against these people, then she could see her omnipotent system slipping her some nifty bonuses to help out. Two trolls, four gargoyles, and one monster spot left. Delta politely sat in new statue and hid her new manor well. Delta had questions about that thing, but she wasn't going to be rude as the four creatures chatted like old friends that had come to Delta's dungeon rather than being created there and then. Delta had a sneaking suspicion. She had only rarely created monsters in bulk before, and there were her goblins and a few of her frogs. New created the monsters in bulk, together. Could it be like twins? Monsters created from the same exact purpose and order. Good that form bonds between them that monsters created separately wouldn't have. She would just have to watch them closely. Data mentally referred to them as by their faces until they chose their names. They were rather firm that they would choose their own names. Data would hopefully respect that. Bat was a simple speaker. His bulk and size made him the obvious powerhouse of the group, but he wasn't tall as he was stacked. Delta saw him as a rock bowling ball, really. Plague Doctor, or Doctor for short, was a tall, spindly gargoyle with wings like silk as they spread. 
His manner of speech were elegant and soft-spoken. Dragon seemed to be some sarcastic being. He answered in mockery more than not. He managed to be polite to Delta. But she could see that it was a struggle. The last one, the handsome-looking gargoyle that had been sculpted after some fallen angel, merely listened and watched Delta for orders, or any hint of disapproval. Together they looked like a group who would be dangerous for the unaware to tackle, and Delta hadn't even upgraded them yet. Are you guys, she said shyly, unsure of how these things bowed towards her. You had made them, not Delta. It was like these creatures didn't have as much reason to like her as the other monsters. What if news desire to the dungeon proper? The group fell silent. Four sets of eyes turned to her. Wings twitched and claws relaxed. Delta mumbled as the creatures leveled their powerful gazes on her. My lady, ignore the ugly visages and gather your courage. We are eager to hear your command. Doctor said gently, Dragon and Bat touched their faces in shock while Angel merely watched. Bat and Dragon knocked into each other, trying to step forward at the same time. Yeah, ignore his ugly face, they both said loudly, pointing to the angel who turned his flat expression to them. While the few of us are uh, lacking in tact, we're all ready to do your bidding. I am quite excited to visit the kitchens and see what can take over the remaining rooms. Doctor said, and then he tilted his head as if hearing something. Doctor, yes, my lady Cole, I would like that name very much. He said with joy. Damn it, Delta had projected too loudly again. But Doctor seemed happy. It was hard to see, since the stone mask didn't have the face, but Delta nodded quickly. Sure, she said and then shrugged, trying not to seem too eager to talk to them. I got rare hopes and stuff if you want to be a doctor, she suggested and waved it off. Not that you have listened. She finished lamely. She blinked and she felt a brief patting on her head. Doctor leaned back up and tilted his head. Too kind. You're very good, Cora Randy. He announced. Delta had to force herself not to float through the ceiling and bury her face. Damn, I need a name quick. Dragon spat in a few more times. The stone tail twisted, and the spikes on the end looking deadly. Delta watched as he paced up the wall, using his claws to easily to keep himself righted as he reached the ceiling. Batty yawned and leaned against the growing tree in the garden and turned to stone. Doctor turned to Angel and gestured for him to speak up. Delta went quiet, eager to see this one speak. I will be your vanguard, he said simply, voice lower than the Delta's human's kill count. He turned, crossing his arms and barely peeked out from his huge, leathery wings. Doctor touched the tip of his beak with his hint of annoyance. Forgive him, milady, vanguard is shy. He said, and the giant man turned, fury on his face. Doctor faced him down, but it was Van who turned away first, before he skulked off to rest near the grove of trees growing in between the few of the doors, the shadows offering him comfort. Doctor held out an arm for Delta. May we walk, he offered, tilting his nose down at a hint of humor. Delta did so, her touch breaking a very few seconds, but she roughly managed to keep him time with Doctor. We were all aware of our purpose, to guard you from the beasts below. There is a hint of worry of what is become of us after you liberate the floor and take it, as you no doubt will, the doctor explained casually. Whatever you want. Creation purpose is just a short-term thing. I'm hoping that you'll find something that interests you. Delta spoke up, feeling better in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Doctor hummed. We have a sense of things in the dungeon, and can see that. But on this floor we only have a kitchen, a library, and a feast hall so far. Job opportunities are scarce, unless we wish to do gardening. I was hoping to ask when you will be taking on the other doors. We can hear movement beyond them. No doubt, various legions are gathering under each door to march on the dungeon. It would be best to take them out soon, so we can limit the numbers we face and open more opportunities to ourselves. Doctor spoke slowly and with the utmost effort for respect. Do you think we should attack soon? Delta asked, trying to make sure that she had a grasp of the doctor's character. The gargoyle slowed and he slowly turned to his beak to Delta. Infection must be cut out before it spreads. I am happy to wield a knife if you so desire. He also hummed. Delta looked around the garden. She had to agree. Letting the foes attack from all sides was just a bad idea. Also, there was no telling how much more the main door of the deepest part of the fortress was hiding. 
Which door do you, we deal with first? She asked quietly. I can answer that. Jack's voice said from behind. Delta spun to see the cobalt staring at a single door that looked plainer than the rest. Doctor's claws didn't reveal themselves, but he slid slightly take a step forward to cover Delta. Jack, what's in there? She asked. Odd reaction from the doctor. He must know that Jack was a contractee. A hole. I'm hoping you can do something about it. Jack replied quietly. The tone worried Delta. It really did. The door exploded open as a grey blur sent mud and soil flying as it turned to slow itself. Dozer on the job. Bat, ah, uh, Dozer, declared as he readied himself for an attack. Not so rough. You don't have a respawn point, Delta warned. Distressed, Doctor and Vanguard entered next. Dragon, still struggling with the name, took up the rear. Jack followed behind, body stiff, with fear as he refused to explain. All Delta knew was that Jack was sure that there would be no enemies in this room. How Jack knew that, Delta didn't know. From the garden, the door revealed a long, dark tunnel. Jack easily made some vials that glowed with a deep green as he shook them. Delta beamed at them and they tried not to despair at her inability to touch things. She wanted a rave and dark, spooky tunnel. Armed with a grove vial each, the gargoyles traversed the tunnel. Delta was using Doctor's eyes to see. It was weird. Like Doctor had heavily lidded glasses on, but if he so desired, his mask became transparent from the inside. It wasn't a mask, really, just his face. The tunnel was long, but ended in a single room. The temperature was horrid. Her gargoyles were getting a sheen of ice over their forms, and Jack was so nervous that he was mumbling to himself. There was a crude wall made from the stone that had frozen over as the doctor neared it. A single path inwards led to a sudden drop into a round hole. A weird contraption was built above the hole. It looked like a rack to contain people to lower them into the hole, and the thing had an adjustable neck collars, the head straps, to keep the prisoners looking every which way, only down. Doctor looked into the hole. Jack tried to yell something, but the doctor leaned right over and peered in. The hole wasn't dark. It was empty. Pure. Clean. Non-existent. It traveled deep. Too deep. It was horrid and Delta watched as Vanguard dropped his glow vial down it. The light spun and bounced a few times off the wall before it crushed. An audible crunch sound from the deep below. The arctic wind exploded up and filled the room with a glacial howling. The wind seeped into Jack and her goyles and they flew down the tunnel where it crashed against her garden. Jack was howling in bleak despair now that all her goyles toppled, gasping. A deep coldness was burying deep into them. It was the deepest part of the ice that Delta had felt the cruelty, the utter hatred of the warmth and life. It buried deep into her monsters and it enjoyed what was left, their pain, their fear. It drank it up like it was a delicious meal and it deeply needed. Delta ignored it. It chewed and nibbled on her freezing monsters like she wasn't any kind of threat, like she was unable to stop it. Like Delta was just a child that the coldness could push aside. She grabbed one of the cold tendrils and bent it like an arm. The whole ice cloud froze. Get out of them now, she ordered from her garden. Raising hot mana surged down like a roaring tide. She bent the writhing tendril and the thing tried to stab her, cut her, chill her. Delta felt like she was being physically assaulted, but she held on and the thing left her monsters and focused on her. It grabbed and pulled her towards the hole. But her mana filled the room and Delta roared as she tore the slimy little worm like ropes. She was fire to the beast's ice, so Delta would burn it like the bug it was. She filled the hole. She stuffed enough mana down there to give it so much congestion that the cold being choked. Hey, warn your little fan club that I'm coming, and when you show up crying like a little brat you are, tell them Delta sent you. She growled. The hole rumbled as her mana tore at the walls, the well, the hole, collapsing as Delta claimed the room. From the collapsing hole came a hoarse scream, but oddly it was easily drowned out by another thing. For Delta's glory. It was many, many tiny voices, and they utterly tore the hole into a solid ground. Then it was over. 
The room was just an empty room, and her manner vanished, and it settled into her place. Holy crap! What did you do? The altar turned to see Nu floating nearby. Pest control, she answered innocently. She was interrupted as Jack jumped up on the ground, kicking and screaming as the hole was. Look now! Look at me now! He spat, and he began hitting the room with his fists. He looked up, and he watched as the rack that was consumed by her manner erased. He curled up slowly, silently, shaking with sobs. Look at me now, he repeated. Delta leaned down, and Jack looked up at her. You done blew it up. I can't be any happier, huh? He said through a tight throat. Delta was a little unsure what to say, so did what she did best. Well, I met this kobold who was on all about his booms. I got inspired, I guess. She tried. Jack snorted and looked at the ceiling. It sucks. The memories are still there, being in that rack. I was hoping they'd blow it up too, he admitted. Delta stood and knew came close, his box writing a small to avoid letting Jack see. There was a uh, small offshoot of the silence, a creek to a lake. Sis said that if you go any further down, the next few silence fortresses will have similar rooms, but still operational, and much bigger. I advise against direct combat until you defeat the lords that rule their layers. It will weaken the silence. News warning was dire, but Delta watched the doctor picked up Jack and carried him out of the room. If it attacks my monsters, I will defend them. Simple as that. She answered back, and she shook her head. There's nothing human in that thing, nothing to reason or bargain with. It's just pure hunger, she said hoarsely, rubbing her cheeks where she had been cut. Her avatar had no actual scratch. That was scary, if nothing else. Come, new, let's go drink to victory and plan more things, she suggested, and they both left the room to follow her monsters. In the darkness of the room where the hole once stood, the dirt shifted and began to sink. The room grew still as a single mushroom unearthed itself. It was a black hurdler, a pure black cap that mutated on the second floor. It sat there for a long moment before it inhaled, the lingering burning manner of Delta being sucked in deeply. It began to glow darkly and deep under the room. The hole that was trying to rebirth itself paused as it felt burning roots strangle the earth, forming bars that the hole could not so easily bypass. The blood curdler evolved once more, and fire became its weapon. Across the sea, settling into a deep valley where miles around could see the godly tree brushing clouds with the tops of its branches. The godly tree was buried deep in a cryo high. It saw many things, the world tree as people called it, watched the events of the world go by, forever content to stay where it was and grow. Some would call it a dungeon, but this was not correct by any means. It was a life unto itself. It had grown and grown until even dragons and mighty elementals could not pierce its bark. Its many, many layers of growth grew different fruits, hosted different creatures, and even had some monster villages in a few parts. The luck of growing into a ley line source had boosted its already mighty powers to new heights. Now, it produced manna for the surrounding lands. The country had grown rich and fertile simply due to the world tree being here. Very few things could truly harm it now. Sometimes I forgot it could feel pain, not unlike ten years ago, when some fire spitter had left a black mark on its trunk. That had angered the tree. But the events that followed were interesting, if nothing else. It felt one of the uppermost branches shift as the mightiest beast on his body moved. He tried paid no mind. The relationship was symbiotic defended the tree, and the tree fed it where meat could not. At that moment, it felt the world shift. A slight change, his many roots spread much farther than this land, and one close to the land once would have felt dead and rotten, now tinged with a spicy life. There was a plant there. No, not a true plant, but something close to it. You are being active, came a soft voice. The tree did not have eyes or a mouth. Every little bark of wood or leaf was the tree itself. The defender of its branches was staring out at the sunrise. Beta, I feel there is those that would rise like myself. The tree spoke, using the green around the beast that built a human-like home in its branches. Just what the world needs, another arrogant jerk tree. 
Beta announced, and her tail swished a dozen stingers formed and dissolved as Beta tried to choose a form to move about in. Perhaps, but this tree allowed the monster of monsters to live here, so respect shall be invoked, the tree reminded. The tail was simply gone and a second later, more arms appeared. So you reminded me, I think something spiderish today. Been a while since I was a spider. We mix in some iron bear. The woman said to herself, Beta had been mewling pig goblin beast when the tree had taken it under its branches. Now, it had eaten like a glutton and become the true monster. I'd prefer something like an ant or a dryad, but you care little for my opinion. I'm telling you that the distant land there are powerful trees and mushrooms growing. It could challenge me for the ley line soon, the tree stated. So, you got dozens. You think people haven't noticed there's no dungeons here? Come on, Egg. Be smarter, tree, than that. Beta lost her human form entirely, became a centipede with salts for legs. One day you will reveal to me what the name means, since you're so amused by it, the tree reminded. Oh, Treebeard, keep your nuts in place, so some young plants get power. You want me to go and nip him in the bud? The worm from the sprouted dragon wings, making Beta into some kind of nightmare waiting to be seen. The tree thought. It searched its roots for possibilities and problems. No, there is a coven of dark witches to the north. They have unearthed one of my roots. They plan nothing good, I assume. Make them naught by a memory. The tree said, and Beta turned into a pure human this time. Her actual form. It was a human girl about the eve of her teens. The round, shapely figure showed her someone who ate well, but kept busy enough to make the curves instead of energy reserves. In human terms, she would be seen as a rich daughter of some nobleman, all the food one could have, and the skin of a well-groomed person. It was hard to imagine that underneath those twinkling green eyes were a thousand monsters that could become a mix to make new forms. Beta the monster of monsters. Sure, you keep looking for that eye and I'll keep you alive. That was the deal. The woman fell from her branches before Soaring Eagle flew up. Ig knew that. It was getting closer to where the mythical eye of the lost nameless one was. If Beta could find that, if the tree could, they would both get their wishes. How exciting. I've chosen, Dragon said as he slurped down more meat from the feast hall. Delta looked up as Jack and Doctor were striking up an odd friendship over chemicals. Jeb and Nashi stopped shoveling food into their own mouths. I'm Draco, Dragon announced. Van God or Van, as Delta took to calling him and shook his head. Dragon, he said. Delta nodded. Dragon sounds less like a snot-nosed ponce going to whine about you, he explained. Dragon crossed his arms. You're all ponces. Fine. I'm Dragon. I'm generic Dragon. He threw his hands up. Delta, who had flashbacks to her wishes, to Sis for no dragons. So far, with a kobold and now a dragon, Sis had listened to her in every way but the symbolic. Dragon sounds cool, like I can't wait to tell people that I have a mighty dragon. Delta promised. Dragon blinked at her before he pumped his impressive biceps. Yeah, well duh, I'm mighty. He laughed as he reached for a goblet, missing twice. Vanguard met her eyes and smiled. This was a small, tiny thing. Delta's face went red and she sunk through the floor. Damn it! Nu, no, why did you have to make him so handsome? She felt a ping. Delta reappeared. Seth is up. He's going to floor too. She yelped and zoomed off. The silence in the hall was broken by Vanguard. Seth is a man, he growled. Jack nodded. Kind of a good looking bloke with the power of an actual non jerkishness to be decent, he said. Pointing to the kitchen, Ferris shared the gossip. He added, Van glowered. Don't get protective over her before you've even spoken ten words. It's creepy. The doctor chided. The look he got back was even darker. He rolled his non-visible eyes and went back to talking explosions with the interesting kobold known as Jack. End of chapter. That, my friends, concludes this episode. I hope that you enjoyed. If you wish to support the author of the story, there will be a link to below. If you wish to support this channel, there are multiple ways to do so, which will all also be linked below. But the easiest way would be to subscribe and share my videos as much as possible. 
And until next time, I hope you all have a good one. And I'll see you all in the next video. Cheers.